Hello, folks. This is Joe from my geek scene. I'm here with Mr. JB Madrox, the Twisted. Jamie, well, how are you doing today? Doing wonderful. It's 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 a pleasure to be here as always. How are you doing, Joe? Not too bad. Not too bad. It's been about mm, roughly three years since the last time I've interviewed you because I interviewed you uh, you two at Astronomicon in 2019, and wow. um, quite a few things have happened since then. Um, yeah, yeah, well, a lot transpired. Absolutely, absolutely. So. All right. Well, actually, normally I don't start this stuff off with like music, the musical topic, but I'll start it off. You had released an album called Unlikely Prescription. Um, I want to say in 2021. Is that correct? That that Tail is the end of 2021. It wasn't in. Yeah, like like it was it was somewhere at the end in the beginning of. Yeah, just about. Yeah. I'm horrible with dates and times. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, obviously it's more of a, a rock oriented album. So my first question to you is, I mean, because you've discussed this album a lot. Mm -hmm. So I guess my approach for this one, sorry for the generic first question. Were there any particular lyrical themes that you wanted to explore with this album? Uh, I, I, lyrical, not necessarily. It was it, the, the idea for me was more about the experimental in, in trying to make a record like where we always since our since our beginning since our, our our creation we've always had rock influences but it's always been dominated by rap where this one was was going to be completely the tables turned it was dominated more by rock and roll with with hints of rap and that was like my main go after like i wasn't more concerned about anything other than that but but like maybe proving proving that we can do it to ourselves uh experimenting we always like to do different things we don't like to make the same record eight times with a different cover. I hate that. I hate when bands do that because I, I, I love things too. And I love bands. I love movies. Uh, everybody's a victim to it. I've seen the same movie with eight with different covers. We all know what I'm talking about. I hate that. Uh, quit half-assing your work. So it was, it was one of those things where we wanted to step up. We wanted to step up to the challenge and, uh, and, and put out a solid record. And I feel we did that. And I, and I feel that it was, uh, it was therapeutic and it was needed in, in, in our, our, we talked about this before we started recording that climbing up the ladder of where you want to be in life or where you're going, whatever your aspirations are, our goal of, of the direction we want to go in. It was good to get that under our belt to uh, as we go forward. So um, since you said you wanted to be experimental, is that why you included more of a, uh, not necessarily more, but an electronic element to your album? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was like a lot of that, a lot of those, uh, those, those sounds and, uh, and, and kind of vibes came about from um, uh, Sean, who is our drummer, Draven. He, uh, he, he was doing production in, in a lot of the tracks and, uh, and, and him and his dude Needles, they um, have a, it's called Danger Within is uh, uh, their production company. And they experiment with a lot of the uh, industrial sounds and stuff like that. So I would say that a lot of that was, was rooted from him but there is a, there's there's sounds and scenes that we're into that we like to uh, bring into the fold of what we do. We're inspired by a lot of things. I like to say that. Fair enough. So um, when I did, I did listen to the album once. Um, mm -hmm. I did enjoy more than a memory. Very good. Very good. And um, it was interesting seeing all the collaborations on the album. Now, obviously, you had Spencer from Ice Nine Kills. Um, yep. Danny Filth from Cradle of Filth, Rich Ward mm -hmm. from Fozzie, and Matt Brandyberry from Ashes to New. So three out of the four uh, guests on there mm -hmm. all are uh, living that rock element and whatnot. Harder rock, should I say. But to go old school, I'm surprised that you had an extreme metal connection with Danny Filth from Cradle of Filth. So how did that collaboration come about? Because I was not expecting that. And like, I'm an old school Cradle of Filth um, fan. Um, Cruelty awesome. and the Beast is like uh, still my favorite album by them. Bought that album twice after like the original one with the crappy drum sounds. And then like they <laughs> remastered it. So they actually booted up the drums on that one. So yeah, uh, old school uh, Cradle of Phil fan. Um, so yeah, how did that uh, collaboration come about? It, it, it came about as, as, as long as we've been doing what we've been doing on the scene and whatever, uh, as far back as we go, even in the ICP days, we used to, anytime we were ever on the cover of a circus magazine, hip parader, any type of publication, alternative press, whatever, what have you, like there would always be cradle of filth. There was always be always, 
always, always, always. And I was intrigued by the imagery. And, and I had just, it was like, we were sitting there one day as we were recording the stuff and I just seen, and I'm like, I remember hearing, um, cause I started following Danny Filth on, on Instagram and he said, it's going to be a Dracula spectacula. And I'm like, Oh, that's so great. I'm like, you know what? We should do a fucking brand new vampire tune with him. We're going to call it, you know, neon vamp. It's going to be the shit. And, uh, and, and lo and behold, he was into it. And I just thought it was a, I think he's awesome for being open to, uh, 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 like opportunity, I guess, not necessarily like I'm bringing a great opportunity to his plate, but he was open to the artistic integrity that we brought. We're, we're completely polar opposites, but we are both drawn together by the idea that we, we both do theatrical music, whether it's death metal and, and, and rap, whatever, rock, core shit. I don't know what you call what we do. I don't know what, what you call it, but, but I like the idea that he rose to the occasion. He treated it with the, uh, the utmost respect, uh, it was just, it was, it was definitely an experience and something that I knew. I, I can't, I, I hate when people say that, you know, I knew, I knew, but I, I knew in my gut that everyone would hear that and be like, twisted at Danny Phil. Wait, what? Wait, no, get the fuck out of here. I knew everyone was going to do that. At least have that one second where they're like, I got to hear this. And, and, and you do. And if you haven't, you should. Fair enough. Cause it's awesome. It's, I, I think it came out exactly the way that it was supposed to be. And it just has this futuristic, uh, like, like um, if the Marvel Cinematic Universe does the soundtrack for the new Blade movie, I strongly suggest they use the two. Product uh, placement there, friends. <laughs> it was pretty cool hearing him do um, his trademark howl in the background. Oh, so. yeah. And yeah, and everybody gave us shit. They were like, dude, it, it, leave it to Twisted to get Danny to rap. It was just awesome. It was like we brought we brought a lot of uh, a lot of fun stuff to the picnic. So um, I don't know if you're planning on continuing down the the rock and metal path for like future releases. But mm -hmm. I did want to ask this, like because I know that um, inspiration comes from pretty much anywhere. Will you by chance be uh, delving into more death metal or black metal for inspiration as far as like either lyrical concepts or Im imagery concepts and whatnot? Um, you know, if it if it pertains to something, we're we're currently working with a producer now um, that's that's helping us with our forthcoming record. So there have been um, uh, references. But, but not necessarily for, uh, for lyrical content, more uh, for like placement or pitch of voice or tone, things of that. Like, like we'll refer to something or are you hip to fill in the blank? And I'm like, no. And I Google and I'm like, oh, you know, like that kind of thing. So it's a lot. It's a, it's a learning process. And I don't claim to know everything and neither does Paul. But we are we are learners and uh, and, and we're having we're having fun. And I think that's what a lot of people forget to do when they're doing this this kind of thing. That, that is uh, uh, what we do. And, and the fact that we can still find fun in it, I think that's what's awesome about it. And I think that's why we continue to be able to do what we do. Having fun in hard rock and metal? Get out of here, man. Come on, man. It's, it's, it's right, right. It's not all bad. It's, I swear, it's, 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 yeah, these people. Some of these people, I tell you what. Uh, no, yeah. We'll go with like old school 90s, like black metal ethos, like no laugh, no fun, no smile. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just yeah, I'm anti all of that. I just broke every one of those stigmas. So yeah, I probably wouldn't do well in that in that uh that scene. I suppose. Oh right. shit! No, no worries. Um, now we're gonna get more into like some of like random musical things for like for you. Now right. I know that you like uh Twelve Foot Ninja. So is is there any particular song that you would recommend to someone who is uh unfamiliar with them or album? Ah. Uh... I like I like Shuriken. That was that was one of my uh, my go to tunes. There are a lot of songs that are on the new record that I don't know by name. I, I know more by the groove or or, or whatever. But I, I like how on the, the the newest record, it's like got this whole like uh, video game vibe, and it's it's Stevic is the guy as far as as my knowledge goes. Stevic's the guy who kind of puts all the stuff together, so I can see that he's got like a lot of. He seems to be a lot like Paul and I in the regard of of like having 
themes and 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 put together concepts for the record like nothing that they put out seems like it's just thrown together it always seems like there is a lot of thought a lot of process uh, a lot of pre-production a lot of everything before it reaches our ears the listeners the fans whatnot so uh i'm intrigued by them uh i can i can describe to you all of their album covers (laughs) (laughs) it's like it's like i don't really know the, the the titles and the names to all this shit but i mean yeah but it's like uh their vibe is great. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't sing enough good shit about them. Uh, I, I'm, I was saddened to hear that. Uh, I think his name is Ken, the, the singer either left the band or is no longer with the band. So I know they're looking for a singer now or something like that. And, uh, and, and that as a fan kind of threw me back because I've seen that happen to a lot of, of my other favorite bands where the, the lead singer will step down or step away or, or is, is removed, whatever the circumstances is. And then someone new comes into the situation. And in some cases it changes, some cases it betters, and in some cases it didn't matter. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, uh, I know in my heart, it's like where it was, is, was, was the top for me. So I'm just hoping they can at least reach that same new, new level wherever they go. Well, that's pretty cool. When I was mm-hmm. looking into them, I was pretty cool to find out that they're from Australia because Australia, yeah. their metal scene um, is pretty cool. I mean, like there's bands that I like, like Grave Upheaval, um, Impetuous Ritual. But my favorite um, death metal band from Australia would have to be Portal. Um, wow. I don't know if you're familiar with Portal, but like no. they, they are all about horror. Like you don't know what any of the band members look like. Um like they don't, I mean, they don't even share their real names. The vocalist is known as the curator. He doesn't really do like those uh, deep death metal growls or the cookie monster vocals. He does more along the lines of like a very harsh whisper. Their lyrics aren't even about like, I mean, it's all horror based and like even trying to decipher their lyrics is like weird, but like from an imagery point of view, uh, like the curator, the vo- uh, vocalist, he changes up his appearance for like every single new uh, Portal release. Oh, wow. And um, like going back, looking at the old school one, he had like this wooden carving uh, over his face. Uh, somewhat people used to call that the clock head error. And oh, wow. like you can't even see his face. And it's just the whole point of the band is to evoke horror. And like when this band, you know, a metal band is doing it right when they make other metal heads feel uncomfortable. I love <laughs> it because it's chaotic, but it's just it just creates this sense of dread that just um, hits me the right way that I don't get from a lot of bands. So like if uh, I would definitely recommend checking out portal and stuff like that, I can send something to uh, George uh, like an album to, for you to check out. Yeah, please. No, I'd love that. It sounds, it sounds like they're inspired by a lot of things either uh, or, or, and or cut from the cloth that we are cut from or in such with the with the different of appearance of every era and and the it's it's very similar to to another band with no one knows who you are number two number three you know like i yeah. like that no they've been around since the 90s so um, i love that i love that but yeah i'll send you some stuff yes please um and i was speaking about how like i emotionally connect with that album um what are some albums that you are emotionally connected with and you still cherish to this day uh, songs you said albums or songs songs um let's see uh i've always liked uh alice in chains dirt that that record for some reason it just bones uh, yeah man it's gonna rain when i die uh stuff like that you know angry like, chair sitting on yeah. an angry chair yes man i love that album i'm sorry for interrupting you dude it was just oh, like no, no, you're that, no i'm vibing with you dude like that's that's like those it's it's a time it's like there everybody kind of went through their grunge era with mostly nirvana i've had my stints with that too but i gravitated to the more what i thought was the heavier side of grunge which was alice in chains uh uh sound garden that kind of vibe you know what i mean like those and then which when, when i allowed myself to be more ginger it went to pearl jam and and shit like that you know what i mean there's there's some good songs on uh i don't know what the fuck the album it is but it's the goat caught in the gate the, that one the second one or whatever there there's like uh um are we yeah, talking about alice in chains no 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 it was for, for pearl jam when oh. i when i went to the, the ginger way you were like oh you, you hit me there yeah no uh, no no like pearl jam's not my wheelhouse like i i respected sure. like uh few of their songs like uh jeremy and whatnot and even yeah. flow but yeah I, w- I was more into like alice in chains myself and like the smashing pumpkins i wouldn't put smash pumpkins yeah. in the grunge era but you know 
they yeah, no, they were cool. Billy Corgan had a way of of of, of making his imprint on on a lot of us and and doing his job well. So I, I, I give him props. Um, but yeah, you know what I mean. It's like that whole that whole scene, that whole sound, that whole Seattle kind of you know singles <laughs> vibe. The movie, the whole the it just after all of it, man. It was it was a time. It was a time for 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 music. It was a lot of the shit that I happened to be into, and it kind of pulled me into it and exposed me more to it. That's why I think what was cool always about Twisted it was like uh, the diversity in listening from a lot of the guys uh, where we started originally with House of Crazies was a lot of rap and I was the hair metal guy and trade off information and, you know, like a uh, data trade, you know, here's Beastie Boys, well, here's Motley Crue, oh, well, here's fucking Run DMC, here's Rat, you know, and it would go back and forth until like we were well-versed on each other's listening abilities or whatever, you know, so it's like, it's never, it's never stopped. I've still been that guy who like always likes the things that maybe not everyone else likes. And I think that's what makes me me. <laughs> no, man. Nice reference to the single soundtrack. I actually still own that. Um, and I was listening to that just recently because okay. I was on a early Smashing Pumpkins kick. And obviously the single soundtrack has the, the song Drown, you know? Yeah. Yeah, man. Seriously, there's there's some there's some good shit. Like I was exposed to like what Mother Love Bone and a whole bunch of shit, you know, during that area. Just, just and then uh Mad Season which was kind of like the, the, the segue away from Alice in Chains was the little more, you know, pot smoking late night music you put on. And it was just, you know, man, it's, it's, there's some, there's some good vibes in there. A lot, a lot, a lot of good music to be had in that, in that circle of uh, music. Chloe dancer. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Come on. You know it. Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, like just uh, <laughs> talking to you right now, I'm thinking right, of right. like the, the, the piano beginning to that song, man. So. For real. Oh shit. Oh no. <laughs> Push me down. He set me up with a janky setup. No worries. Here we go. <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, speaking of things going wrong when you least expect it, uh, that actually segues into my next question. Uh, okay. Since you've been performing for quite some time, any Spinal Tap moments on stage? When I think of Spinal Tap, I think of the guy who, like, like I think it was like Lenny or Squiggy. I can't remember which one it was, but wrapped his, his cucumber with a woman. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's what I think of when I think of Spinal Tap. So I would say no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. The answer to your question is no. No, I, I don't know. I would I would say no. I don't know. I'd have Having to, got I, lost backstage on the way to the uh, to the stage. It's possible. It's possible. Back in the in the in the early days when we used to play some of the amphitheaters and stuff like that, it's it's very easily to get lost between uh, craft services and, and and your green room. That is that is a possibility. I won't I won't rule that out. I wouldn't know anything about that. <sighs> but so I I I have to while doing my research, I did find out that you performed at too many games. Mm -hmm. And um, I was not expecting that. Um, but you guys should show up wherever. And whenever, so that's pretty cool. That's awesome. While you were um, at the uh, the event, did you check out any of the sets from the Nerdcore artists like Schaefer the Dark Lord, MC Lars, or MC Front a lot? Um, I did not. I I, I don't want to pretend like I did. We were we were very <laughs> we were very in and out. I, I would have. I, I no nothing against those 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 guys. I've heard great things. Um, I was I was intrigued by the dealer room. More than anything, Paul and I, uh, obviously, you know, Astronomicon, we, we, we love the, the inner workings of conventions and things like that. So I was attracted to the dealer floor. There's, there's a, a grading company called WADA and, and they grade video games. And I was trying to see how many people had graded video games. It was my big deal. I had never been to a game convention ever before in my life. So I was taken back by that more than anything. You could have told me Alice in Chains was playing in there and I would have probably missed that as well. So again, like I said, no disrespect to any of the other performers. It was, I was in the zone. I was trying to see what is the old uh, NES game system in the box worth. I had agendas, man. I had a fucking checklist. Me and Paul were running around with the social media. It was great. It was great. We love to get our conventions on. Fair enough. All right. Well, speaking of uh, conventions, you did mention Ashnomicon. So this actually segues into uh, part two of this interview. After, <laughs> after five years of Ashnomicon, what lessons have you learned from running a convention? Um, that, that talent and celebrities are people too. Um, that and I think that people tend to forget that in the the somewhere like people put other people put celebrities on a pedestal 
So they forget how to people, people forget how to people skills to begin with since COVID, everybody doesn't know how to people anymore. You can't talk to anybody. They don't know how to respond unless it's a text. Like just people are all fucked up to begin with. So that said, but when it comes to a celebrity, people tend to walk on eggshells even more so. So the most simplest of things, you know, the, the, the person's pissed because they want Starbucks or they're hungry. They just got off the plane and they want something to eat. It's, you know what I mean? Treating people like normal people. It's like, you just, what, did, did anyone get them food? Well, I didn't want to ask. I didn't want to be rude. I didn't want to, I didn't want to look Prince in the eyes, you know, like, come on, dude, you got Prince in the goddamn green room starving. It's like, you just treat people like people treat people like how you want to be treated. Um, I think that's a key factor that we've learned as we go forward. Um, and you find out that a lot of the people that, that a lot of the misconceptions that are said about people in the industry are a lot of the times because of who they dealt with. It's not the people. It's the situations the people were put in. Oh, so-and-so is an asshole. So-and-so is a blah, 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 whatever the case may be. I, more times than not, that's not true. It's so-and-so was put into a situation where you and I would be an asshole too. It's just that you and I, it doesn't matter as much because we're not, you know, Oscar winner, fill in the blank person. You get what I'm saying? It takes the validity away because, you know, you don't have that accolades and the whatever. So I, that's one thing that, that I would think absolutely would be uh, treat people like how you want to be treated. And I've noticed. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that that and just and and communication, making sure that everybody fully understands what's happening. The 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 you know, like a lot of times people have no idea and and the lack of communication. Where are you supposed to be? What time are you supposed to be there? Well, I don't know. I was going to get a call from somebody. You know, like you shouldn't have to call somebody eight times to find out your information. It was straightforward. You know, communication is the key to a lot of things. So I believe that communication all the way around and treating people how you want to be treated is is what I've learned. No, I definitely stick with both of those, man. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I've done over 200 interviews and I've uh, I don't get starstruck um, or very rarely do I do. And I always treated people like people. And I think I feel that the guests appreciate that more instead of me because I could have easily been like, oh, Jamie Madrox as I dropped my mouse on the ground, but oh, well. Uh, I, I, I can't. <laughs> I'm um, it's all about equal, uh, equality and equivalency, folks. Humans, I tell you, humans. Uh, but I could have been like, oh, my God, Jamie Madrox. Oh, my God, I love everything that you do, you know, and like. Right, right. Um, and it comes off. It's like it's like it comes off as fake. And I, I prefer just you, you be yourself as you would prefer me be myself as we would prefer anyone to be their self. It's, it's, it's that simple. And I think that it's, it's that, that fakeness that, that the world allowed to be the norm, which is what, as, as we do what we're doing now, which is strip that bullshit away and just talk like normal people do. I think the more people do that, I think the more that that kind of, oh my God, it just kind of make, it points out that, yeah, that's fake. Well, being a sycophant can only get you so far. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. Besides, I want to be able to look myself in the mirror and be happy with uh, what I see instead of like, oh, now I'm looking in the mirror and I got brown on my nose because my uh, head was so far up this dude's ass. You know, it's just yeah. I, I don't really believe in that, man. You're just a human I being. I don't think you should have to. That's And that's a, uh, one of the points about interviews is that so that people can uh, get to know the people that, that are, are coming up or trying to come up and, and you provide that service. So it's a, it's, it's a give and take all the way around. I think a lot of people forget about all that. That's how we are with our, with our tours and all of that stuff too. Again, another thing about the convention in five years, take care of your staff. Your staff might not be the, the stars and the pop culture icons that are coming there to, to be seen, but they are what's helping you make the, the situation happen. So again, treating everybody with respect and somebody. So again, more, more, more people shit, more human shit. We're all, we're all capable of error and flaw. Celebrate motherfuckers. And maybe they'll give you dedication. <laughs> For sure. Um, what would you like to bring to future Astronomicon events? Not necessarily who, but what would you like to incorporate? Um, I don't know. I, you know, like, I, I don't want to say nothing cheesy, like laser tag or something like that, but, but uh, there was a thing that we seen that was, and I'm going to tell it better than it was, but this was like, I don't know if you're hip to, but a while ago there was the Walker stalker conventions. They were like a, um, yes. kind of like AMC spinoff of the walking dead show. And, and I mean, that they were, they were the big deal. And at one of them, there was like a, uh, an obstacle course that you were chased by zombies. And that sounds amazing. 
That sounds amazing. I don't care. I, I cheese on that. I get hype on that. I'm like, I'm thinking a big maze, like some some old uh, The Shining, the hedge maze, and you're being chased by by zombies through that. And if you make it through, you win a prize. If you don't, you you, you get tagged and you become a zombie. I don't know. There's got to be some rules to the shit. I'm just making it up as I go. But that's what I would like to see. I would like to see something like that. Obviously, that's the uh, the Spielberg edition of, of what I'd like to see. In reality, it's probably just some <laughs> it's some planks and pipes and bisqueing. But it still looks cool in my mind. All right. I would like to delve into uh, more pop culture stuff. OK. So you are massively into Funko Pops. I am. What was your first one? My first one was... I think it was um, Frankenberry. There was a, uh, uh, a New York Comic Con metallic Frankenberry, and I think it was the the set of the three: the Frankenberry, Count Chocula, and Booberry. The the three, and they're like grails to this day. I've had those things forever, um, and I love them. They're like the most important Funkos that I have. They're they're worth. They have some value to them, and uh, but but there are more sought after pieces. People would say, "Oh, those are nothing," but to me, they're everything. Fair I enough. Uh, not necessarily Funko, but what or which toys have eluded your collection? You can include Funko if you want to, but it's not necessarily Funko based. No, there there's like um, currently currently there is a uh, it's called Curse of the Mummy. It is an old rack toy. Uh, it, it's, it's a very cheap, uh, sarcophagus and there's like this little blow mold mummy that sits in it. And Arco is, this is, I'm really showing my nerd here. Okay. All right. So, so Arco is a company who put it out originally and that version of it on the card has different card art and it's more sought after it's more high value. And then there's another version that comes out later on in life, um, at KB toys and it's by like play and things or something like that. The exact same toy. A different packaging um and the first one has eluded me and there's a few parachutists from ahi that i've, I've wanted forever that i've yet to find but i'll, I'll find them i'll track you down <laughs> I, uh, well I, I i love it i love this shit that's what i do uh best score from frankensons best score from frankensons <laughs> or toy tokyo well, 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 uh, uh, Toy Tokyo would have been Monoxide. He, he scored some good stuff from there. He got a lot of grails from there uh, a while back. Um, Frankenstein's best score, I think, was a She-Hulk number one that I bought. It was raw when I bought it. I got it graded and it was missing a staple in the bottom corner, live and learn. This is this was, but it was cool because it got a green label. So this looks cool with the She Hog vibe. And she has a show coming up on Disney Plus. So I'm hoping it goes up in value. This shit's like stocks and stuff. So when they get to play, so to speak, on television, it creates a buzz. So they say. I don't know who they are, but I hope they come with money. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, you two have had a. Uh... Uh, some action well I wouldn't say necessarily action figures but we'll go with action figures through uh, knuckleheads yep um yep. for future twisted uh, action figures would you like to have like a McFarland toys run or are there any other companies that you would like like oh my god I would love to have my character placed through this company um or yeah, created through this company yeah 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 there's I mean obviously all the greats you know like I, I love Mego. And uh, and and I'm cool with Frank Wojo and and the guys at, at Migo Toy Corp. There, I've collected their toys since I was little, and now they're back again. So they do toys. So obviously, that would be a great uh, uh, thing for me to look back in the toys that I played with as a child to be one. Nowadays, that would be cool. Um, um, you you said Funko. Obviously, that would be great. Uh, Super Seven. Super Seven is a great toy company putting out a lot of great toys. Love would love to be have something through them. And again, McFarland. McFarland does great stuff. He's done, he has pushed the envelope in the toy community for the longest time. He came in with comic book heat. He made the right crazy calls. Everybody was like going off on him for buying the, the Mark McGuire ball. He got his name in everyone's mouth. And then he brings out a toy company. Next thing you know, he's got the MLB account. He's got the, the, the NBA account. He's got the NHL account. He's doing all the sports toys properly with all the licensing, using all of the logos and such. That's not an easy task. 
So it's like from someone like me who understands the validity of what that, how he acquired that, it's genius. And it's like, I, you know, I game respect game, as they say in my world. And it's just like, I, I, I see that. And I'm like, you built your company properly and, and have done toys for everyone from Alice Cooper to Rob Zombie. So yeah, that would be, that would be a cool one too, man. And NECA, NECA, don't sleep on NECA. NECA is great. NECA's got a great line of retro, re, I think they're called retro cloth action figures where they're like Mego guys, but they're like even more highly detailed and come with accessories and very cool. Very cool. So, so there, you asked for one, I gave you eight. <laughs> very, thorough, very thorough. No, it's completely fine. I mean, I still have my, um, I actually only have two uh, McFarland toys. I have uh, Ash from Army of Darkness and I have uh, Eric Draven of The Crow. And those are still unopened. I don't, I will never sell those. I just um, Great. wanted those. I mean, I was a huge Crow fan back in the day. Hell, that's like my back tattoo, you know? Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. I didn't, that's a back tattoo has got to hurt. And when you say back tattoo immediately, you just think of pain. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the, the whole tattoo took like over two hours and stuff like that. And everything was fine except for like the last 10 minutes when I had like words inscribed on like middle of the back, that part hurt the most, but like the big crow on the back. Nah, that was fine. Yeah. You described your back into two columns tender and sweet meats <laughs> and keeping the tenders like oh yeah and they got to come back the next day i'll just come back and we'll re-get in there oh god no yeah man i, I can only imagine I, I yeah picking up on the second day of some work is 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 uh with tattoos is, is definitely no fun oh no i i bled out a lot of the ink um for the through that first month so i had to come back and get re-tatted the next month so i it was two months wearing plastic wrap and uh vitamin d ointment on my back oh man hopefully hopefully uh the results were were worth all your efforts put forth oh, I mean, yeah i mean it's faded with age i've had this tattoo for like over 17 years so i mean right not on. quite 20 but yeah i can understand i mean it's it comes with time but yeah work uh Big stands up for itself I, I love i love eric draven i love the crow i love i love james obar i like the comic book series all that shit and it's it's awesome i've been a fan of it i've hear i've, I've heard good things i heard that uh the guy um i don't want to butcher his name something scars i believe is the guy who was pennywise the clown he has been cast to play eric draven in the new rendition of the crow coming out soon i'm surprised that that thing's still going to happen because like uh that that's a series that's been in production uh limbo for ever and I believe a lot of people have said it's cursed so so there's that 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 hollywood funk that goes around with it you know like like bad cheese and you're just like oh man come on i don't think it's that bad because it's like it has such an underground following it is a cult following literally when you describe a cult following it's like crow is one of the greatest examples of a cult following because it's big but you still find that portion of people who are like wait what is it called and you're like are you fucking serious <laughs> right now so yeah so interesting well, all right. A uh, impromptu question um, mm -hmm. for that on the crow. So what would you prefer? Would you prefer like a movie or like a Netflix uh, type of series? Like, you know, like maybe it can be all in one season. Not, it doesn't have to be like, mm -hmm. well, we have to have multiple seasons of, of this. I mean, you can just have it as one season. Star Wars has shown me that you can break movies up into uh cinematic seasons and series and things like that so so what i used to would have frowned upon and been like oh that's not the proper light that it could be in it could exist in that i think the key factor is that it's done correct and it's done um with with integrity to the comic books all the original comic books were very very dark in i want to say there were three three renditions of the crow and and they just keep getting bad they go from amazing with uh uh brandon lee and then it goes somewhere and then it gets even worse and they're like i, I don't know if you're familiar with them or whatever but you mean the movies or like the yeah, comics movies the movies oh god i'm it like city of angels i'll give that a pass you mm -hmm. know that's fine but once yeah. we started getting into Salvation and all the other movies, no, it was hot garbage, dude. And like it, to this day, just terrible. Yeah, it seemed like it seemed like anyone could have access to the intellectual property if they had like, you know, ten dollars in a ham sandwich or something like that. So it's like we would like to. So 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 there's the first thing I would like some integrity in, in, a, in into whatever it is. And I feel if done in the proper light could could do very well. 
very well for a franchise. I mean, if, if someone wanted to build off of that character, like I believe there's a lot, like we're starting to see love for Sandman and, 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 and things like that that are coming full circle that have been out there forever. Like Gaiman's been big with his writings and shit like that forever. And it's just now seems like starting to get a fair shake according to normal folk who would, would have normally stepped over it, never gave it the time of day. So I think that we're starting to be, everyone's starting to be more primed to, uh, to listen and pay attention. So it's a good time. I think it could hit now if someone did it right. You hear that, Jason Blum, if you're listening, The Crow. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. I can imagine a Blumhouse production of The Crow would probably be killer. Nice. Actually, James O'Barr was the very first interview I ever conducted. Damn, right on, dude. Hell yeah. Oh, uh, dude. Oh, well, looking back at that, I'm still proud of it. But like, if you would have did like a drinking game for every time I said, um, you would have had alcohol poisoning by minute two. Hands <laughs> down, dude. I love it. That's great. That's great. All right. So, um, well, we're on the comic subject right now. Your name is based on the multiple man from the Marvel mm-hmm. series um, at Marvel Comics. Yeah, I would say series because like X-Force, X-Men, Jimmy Madrox been, has been in a lot of stuff. Yep. And for, I can't wait for some nerd out there. Well, no, I wouldn't say nerd, but like some keyboard warrior like, oh, my God, he was never in X-Force. <sighs> you know, I'm like, dude, seriously, I read a lot of comics. I can't pin it on all to one. Yes, yes, indeed. I believe uh, first appearance in Fantastic Four, giant size number four or five. I can't recall, but yeah, uh, an amazing, an amazing character. Um, liked it, liked the idea because of the um, the he could replicate himself, uh, dealing with like a lot of personality disorders and things of that nature. It was it's easier or was easier at the time to take on the form of something so the idea of replicating yourself fit very well my name happened to be jamie and it's just like a glove man <laughs> yeah very inspired by well people talk about like what super power you would have i would take that because you know how much stuff i could get done you know like hey i don't feel like going to work today i'll send a clone to uh to work take care of my shift you know better believe it you better believe it that and that's the best way and sometimes uh life is easier dealing with it if you could just send a clone on your behalf or i guess like now you could have a team under you that are all you and then that way you can uh catch up with what we were talking about earlier that the social media game out there because you Mm -hmm. literally have to have a whole team of people just doing that constantly you know and at times and at times i feel like that i feel like that sometimes in life where i feel like uh you know, you, you have yourself to blame. So if you are a team of your own, then you just yell at yourself, you know, like, why didn't you do this? Or you didn't do that. Oh, it's the guy in the mirror who didn't do it. I would totally fire myself if I wasn't me. No. (laughs) Uh, Cherish comics from your personal collection. Cherish comics from my personal collection. Uh, ASM 300 first appearance of Wolverine. um, Pardon me, Venom. Sorry, first appearance of Venom. Uh, what else? What was I was going to say Wolverine. What I have a Frank Miller Wolverine um, number one. That's pretty cool. That's another cherished one because I because Hulk 181 is the first appearance of Wolverine. Had it long time ago. Got rid of it. Never probably will ever get it back now. Seeing the the prices that it's at. Um, something else. What else? Uh, the Crow. The Crow number one. I have a nice graded crow number one too. So those are a few of my uh, uh, most sought or coveted, I guess you could call them. Is that what you call them? When oh, you for love- sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So those will be that. Have you met James O'Barr? I have not. I have not. I have a few books signed by him that I got in a trade, but I've never met him. I hear he's cool. Not a bad dude. Kind of quiet yeah. and withdrawn, but um, not a bad dude. Uh, let's see. Well, obviously, you mentioned the Sandman and stuff, because I was going to ask, are you into in, any indie comics and stuff like uh, Preacher, The Boys, Transmetropolitan, The Sandman? The list goes on and on. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, always, always inspired by people who are able to uh, function without, you know, or, uh, without or between the, the always the great two, which was Marvel and DC. I believe Sandman was in, like, Vertigo, which was, like, a subsidiary of DC or something. So, like... Uh, definitely still an extension of the two but but things like that that are able to come down the line like something's killing the children or something like that like those are great uh intellectual properties that exist and it, and it goes to show that it's like it doesn't have to always come from a mega powerhouse to actually be a good story a good story at the end of the day is a good story so that's that's what i love most about the indie books 
Um, so what are some of your favorite live adaptations of comics? Live adaptations of comics. Uh, yeah, you don't really get to talk about this stuff so much in your interviews, dude. I've noticed. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I would probably say uh, the Spider-Man movies. I, I think those were the greatest as far as that. I still don't feel that they've gotten uh, Green Goblin correct. And I have hopes for Hobgoblin because I keep hearing that they're pushing Ned Leeds to, to take on that mantle. There's word about the, the discourse boards and such. Um, I think that's cool. Um, and I, I, was, I was blown away by the first Avengers. Like, like watching it and now, now like hearing people refer to it as a classic is scary because, because, you know, it is one of the pioneering films that get us to where we are after you get to the infinity gauntlet and everybody drops Thanos's name. Like it's no big deal. It's like, you know, everybody knows Thanos now. Like there was a time when nobody knew him and it's like the first av Avengers with the Chitari and all that shit. You know what I mean? It's just like, it had such an impact and just like, uh, it was very epic. So I would say, I would definitely say that. I want to say the Venom movie because I like Venom a lot and probably Spider-Man is by far my favorite Marvel character. So Venom would be a very close extension of that. Uh, but the movie was more like little kiddish, I think is the best way to describe it. It had its times, but kiddish. Um, speaking of art, you've done art yourself. Um, like what is mm -hmm. drawing with a twist? What, what is what is drawing with a twist? Yes. I mean, I know what the answer is. I mean, I seen you did it at an Astronomicon panel where you were yeah. sitting down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's an opportunity where at our convention, we um, I like to draw and and uh, Paul is intrigued by it. And he thinks that he, he cannot draw. And I jokingly with him was like, you can draw. I can show you how to draw something. And he's like, well, if you can show me how to draw it, show them how to draw it. So we bring in the, you know, the eighth grade overhead projector and we put it on the wall and we go through uh, simple stages on drawing shapes and trying to show people little uh, tricks and trades that they could use to make their own caricatures and cartoons and such. So it's fun. It's fun. It's fun to be able to uh, to bullshit and teach at the same time or, or to or to have let people have fun and you walk away with learning something. It's not just all blowing smoke. You actually with take away something and learn from it so it's 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 cool it's a fun thing to be a part of so who are your influential artists when you were growing up Todd McFarlane Jack Kirby uh uh I believe his name is Bruce Tim responsible for all the animated Batman oh yeah um Batman yeah the animated series animated series yeah like like those type of uh, uh blocky like they Kirby and, and Tim showed me that you don't have to be Arthur Adams or McFarlane to draw. You can draw simplistic, boxy character. Like, I, I think another person I'm probably going to butcher his name, but like Mike Mignola or something like that. Hellboy. Uh, Hellboy, yeah. Um, amazing artist. Amazing artist and, and knows, again, same, the same procedure, how to draw blocky images where you don't have to know how to draw everything in great detail. You can still have just enough to push the image and, and it's in held in the same regard as someone who, you know, uh, a Jim Lee or a Wills Protasio in there, you know, just detailing the fuck out of something. Are you into like anime or manga by chance? Uh, I, 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 I don't dislike it. I just don't have a great knowledge of it. My knowledge of it was Ninja Scroll. And, and I love, I love both of those movies. They're highly regarded in my world. And, and that is the, that, they were so good. I just closed the doors after that. <laughs> oh no, you popped me on that one. That's pretty good. I mean, like I still own Ninja Scroll. Well, the first movie. So, so good. So very good. So good. Like even still just watching it today, it still holds up. It was so ahead of its time. And I still think it, it, it moves right. It, it feels like uh, a violent Thundercats. It feels like it has that cinematic, like it, it moves like a movie. I love it. It's really good. Well, can I throw something your way as far as like a manga goes? Because uh, you're into comics. Uh, I would highly recommend Berserk. Berserk? Is that, uh, that's not the Keanu Reeves one. That's Berserker. That's Berserker. No, Berserker's, um, unfortunately, the artist and writer, Kentaro Miura, passed away last year. But if you're, like, into horror and, like, I mean, I'm not pigeonholing you as, like, I'm hoping I'm not coming off as pigeonholing you. Like, oh, Jamie likes horror, horror, horror. That's it. But, like, I would have to say flat out 
um, that uh, Berserk is my favorite manga series of all time. It is a very brutally violent um, fantasy series. Interesting. So, um, and the artwork is flat out amazing. Like, um, like if you delve into this and you see the artwork from this, you're going to be like, oh my goodness. And plus the series has influenced a lot of things in pop culture. You see like oh, wow. heroes with massive swords uh, oh, that wow. came from Berserk, hands down. So Interesting. Oh, I definitely have to check that out. That sounds, that sounds beyond interesting. Um, because Dark Horse has been releasing their, uh, uh, the series um through like these deluxe books dark horse has been hosting this series for quite some time interesting so, very cool all right uh let's delve into this so we can wind this down uh have you finally been able to meet john carpenter and get an autograph i have not i no. have not no i i was going to uh there was a um he goes on the road kind of like how we do and, and tours and sets up. And I believe it's uh, now it's him and his son, Cody and, and, and another person. And they do the whole synth thing with the keyboards and, mm -hmm. the home, and, and it's movie projector behind him playing the scenes from the movies. And it's really, from what I understand, it's a great, it's a, it's a great two, three hours of your time. It's, it's, it's really awesome. So I've been wanting to catch that. I did not catch it when it came through my neck of the woods. I think we had to go somewhere or leave. I was getting, getting on a plane the weekend. It was happening, something like that. So I missed out. It wasn't meant to be, but I'm sure it will happen. Or, or I, I hope to at least uh, cross paths with him at some point and, and like, you know, just say, Hey, thank you for Michael Myers. I don't think enough people tell you that. Maybe he can potentially be a future guest in an astronomicon down the road. If that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, I mean, since you mentioned, like, you're just segueing into my questions for me, so I appreciate that. Uh -oh. uh, you were talking about, like, uh, he's done concerts and stuff. What Carpenter movie do you feel has the best soundtrack? Carpenter movie do I feel has the best soundtrack? Um... I want it's 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 a it's a it's a toss up between um it's probably I, I I gravitate to two Halloween two it's basically the redeal from one but there's extra there's there's more there's like lurking I believe is one of what they're called and they're like different musical pieces that that uh go with the the overall theme but I do like uh season of the witch Aside from the eight more days to have silver shamrock, aside from that, like, like if you listen to like the actual, like Google it on YouTube and then like, just put it in the background while you're doing things, cleaning the house or whatnot, or organizing your CDs or whatever the hell you do. And you like, you're like, this is deep. This is really moody. He, he has a way of, of, uh, of like, putting down that, that carpet, so to speak in, in the, in the scene, like his, his moods, the timing, he knows how to match it. It accompanies his vision. Well, because obviously he knows what he wants you to feel. So it's, it, it's a, it's good, but it's also good. Cause when, you know, in theory, your eyes are covered, you're just listening. It's still, it still hits. I'm not going to front and say like, I've watched every single John Carpenter movie, but the one soundtrack that sticks out the most for me is big trouble in little China. Big trouble in little China. Interesting. I haven't seen it in a while. So I don't know as far as like the musical score and stuff like that. I was going to say fog, but again, it's a lot of the low, you know, low droning synth and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So he was, he definitely had a wheelhouse that, that he was doing, you know what I mean? But it, it, it begat a style for him to what he's in for today. Pork Chop Express, man. That's uh, the, the yeah. one song you need from, uh, uh, <laughs> from John Carpenter. So uh, as we're winding down, I couldn't really fit this into the whole um, interview as far as like subjects around it, but Will there be any more taste test videos from you two? Uh, yeah, I'm sure that's that's definitely possible. Uh, Monoxide like specifically goes and 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 like subscribes to all of these strange boxes and, of treats and 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 experiences and mystery boxes and all kinds of fun stuff. So yeah, I would I would say yeah, I, I wouldn't rule it out. It's too much fun to not do. Uh, I couldn't help but laugh at that. You two, um, like I mentioned to you when I interviewed you a few years ago, that you two have uh, good chemistry together and you Absolutely. you have very good comedic timing and it's natural. So I, I can appreciate that. So that video actually had me laughing and I was like, I was like, there's only two. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe, I believe there's more, there's, 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 there's more to come, but I believe we filmed more as well and they're just releasing them throughout. But yeah, there was a series. I know we, we got through, uh, I want to say two of the boxes, uh, the, the, I think they were called Yum's Express or something like that, something like that. But yeah, the, it's definitely, definitely uh, interesting to see the snacks that people uh, endure around the world. Final three questions. What's new that you would like to promote? What's new that I would like to promote? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. We're, we're, we're working on a new record in the studio right now. Um, Songs of Sam Hain, volume three, Cult of Night. Uh, it will be out in September, October. It, okay. is, a, it is a brand new um, edition in a series of, uh, of, of Songs of Sam Hain, uh, autumn inspired music that we've been putting out. It is volume three. It is the best one so far. It is, uh, it is starting to take on a, uh, a vibe of its own, which I'm proud to say, and I'm excited about it. I've been working on that and, uh, I'm actually turning that in today or tomorrow. I just finalized the artwork with the guy doing it and, uh, track listing and all the good stuff. So I would like to promote that and, uh, and, and tell everybody to keep their eyes peeled for that because it is the perfect, uh, a company thing to, uh, the, the perfect accoutrement to your holiday vibe for autumn. If like people get Mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, my goodness. Like, whenever fall comes around. Uh, yeah, and pumpkin spice, everything. Pumpkin spice, kitty litter, you know, it just, it's a free for all. Everything pumpkin spice. Uh, if people wanted to find you online, where could they follow you? Uh, on Instagram, it's uh, at pops underscore and underscore vintage. Um, Official Twisted um, is the Facebook and Instagram. Uh, at Tweet Me So Hard is the Twitter. Um, we're on social media pretty much every day. So if you're looking for me, you shouldn't be too hard to find me. Um, hope to see you out there <laughs> in the, in the great world that we live in. Uh, final question. What would be your message for all the fans throughout the years? Um, thank you for listening to us. Thank you for supporting us in what we do. Thank you for, uh, giving us this life that we get to live and, uh, we appreciate you and, um, look forward to seeing you at some of the upcoming shows and uh, representing, pulling up and supporting what we do, man. I can never say thank you enough. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for granting this interview for me. Thank you, Joe, I appreciate you. All right, well, folks, this is Joe from My Geek Scene with Jamie Madrax at Twisted. Take it easy.